that once anything like a cultural divide gets established, all the social forces operate to make it not less rigid, but more so. The two cultures were already dangerously separate 60 years ago, but a prime minister like Lord Salisbury could have his own laboratory at Hatfield, and Arthur Balfour had a somewhat more than amateur interest in natural science. John Anderson did some research in inorganic chemistry in Leipzig before passing first into the civil service, and incidentally took a spread of subjects which is now impossible. None of that degree of interchange at the top of the establishment is likely, or indeed thinkable, now. In fact, the separation between the scientists and non-scientists is much less bridgeable among the young than it was even 30 years ago. 30 years ago the cultures had long ceased to speak to each other, but at least they managed a kind of frozen smile across the gulf. Now the politeness is gone, and they just make faces. It is not only that the young scientists now feel that they are part of a culture on the rise while the other is in retreat. It is also, to be brutal, that the young scientists know that with an indifferent degree they'll get a comfortable job, while their contemporaries and counterparts in English or history will be lucky to earn 60% as much. No young scientist of any talent would feel that he isn't wanted or that his work is ridiculous, as did the hero of Lucky Jim, and in fact, some of the disgruntlement of Amos and his associates is the disgruntlement of the underemployed arts graduate. There is only one way out of all this, it is, of course, by rethinking our education. In this country, for the two reasons I have given, that is more difficult than in any other. Nearly everyone will agree that our school education is too specialized. But nearly everyone feels that it is outside the will of man to alter it. Other countries are as dissatisfied with their education as we are, but are not so resigned. The U.S. teach out of proportion more children up to 18 than we do, they teach them far more widely, but nothing like so rigorously. They know that, they are hoping to take the problem in hand within 10 years, though they may not have all that time to spare. The USSR also teach out of proportion more children than we do, they also teach far more widely than we do, it is an absurd Western myth that their school education is specialized, but much too rigorously. They know that, and they are beating about to get it right. The Scandinavians, in particular the Swedes, who would make a more sensible job of it than any of us, are handicapped by their practical need to devote an inordinate amount of time to foreign languages. But they too are seized of the problem. Are we? Have we crystallized so far that we are no longer flexible at all? Talk to schoolmasters, and they say that our intense specialization, like nothing else on earth, is dictated by the Oxford and Cambridge scholarship examinations. If that is so, one would have thought it not utterly impracticable to change the Oxford and Cambridge scholarship examinations. Yet one would underestimate the national capacity for the intricate defensive to believe that that was easy. All the lessons of our educational history suggest we are only capable of increasing specialization, not decreasing it. Somehow we have set ourselves the task of producing a tiny elite, far smaller proportionately than in any comparable country, educated in one academic skill. For 150 years in Cambridge it was mathematics, then it was mathematics or classics, then natural science was allowed in. But still the choice had to be a single one. It may well be that this process has gone too far to be reversible. I have given reasons why I think it is a disastrous process, for the purpose of a living culture. I am going on to give reasons why I think it is fatal, if we're to perform our practical tasks in the world. But I can think of only one example, in the whole of English educational history, where our pursuit of specialized mental exercises was resisted with success. It was done here in Cambridge, 50 years ago, when the old order of merit in the mathematical tripos was abolished. For over a hundred years, the nature of the tripos had been crystallizing. The competition for the top places had got fiercer, and careers hung on them. In most colleges, certainly in my own, if one managed to come out as senior or second wrangler, one was elected a fellow out of hand. A whole apparatus of coaching had grown up. Men of the quality of Hardy, I, Ittlewood, Russell, Eddington, Jeans, Keynes, went in for two or three years training for an examination which was intensely competitive and intensely difficult. Most people in Cambridge were very proud of it, with a similar pride to that which almost anyone in England always has for our existing educational institutions, whatever they happen to be. If you study the flysheets of the time, you will find the passionate arguments for keeping the examination precisely as it was to all eternity. It was the only way to keep up standards, it was the only fair test of merit, indeed, the only seriously objective test in the world. The arguments, in fact, were almost exactly those which are used today with precisely the same passionate sincerity if anyone suggests that the scholarship examinations might conceivably not be immune from change. In every respect but one, in fact, the old mathematical tripos seemed perfect. The one exception, however, appeared to some to be rather important. It was simply, so the young creative mathematicians, 
such as Hardy and Littlewood, kept saying, that the raiding had no intellectual merit at all. They went a little further, and said that the Tripos had killed serious mathematics in England stone dead for a hundred years. Well, even in academic controversy, that took some skirting round, and they got their way. But I have an impression that Cambridge was a good deal more flexible between 1850 and 1914 than it has been in our time. If we had had the old mathematical tripos firmly planted among us, should we have ever managed to abolish it? 2. Intellectuals as natural Luddites. The reasons for the existence of the two cultures are many, deep, and complex, some rooted in social histories, some in personal histories, and some in the inner dynamic of the different kinds of mental activity themselves. But I want to isolate one which is not so much a reason as a correlative, something which wins in and out of any of these discussions. It can be said simply, and it is this. If we forget the scientific culture, then the rest of Western intellectuals have never tried, wanted, or been able to understand the Industrial Revolution, much less accept it. Intellectuals, in particular literary intellectuals, are natural Luddites. That is specially true of this country, where the Industrial Revolution happened to us earlier than elsewhere, during a long spell of absent-mindedness. Perhaps that helps explain our present degree of crystallization. But, with a little qualification, it is also true, and surprisingly true, of the United States. In both countries, and indeed all over the West, the first wave of the Industrial Revolution crept on, without anyone noticing what was happening. It was, of course, or at least it was destined to become, under our own eyes, and in our own time, by far the biggest transformation in society since the discovery of agriculture. In fact, those two revolutions, the agricultural and the industrial scientific, are the only qualitative changes in social living that men have ever known. But the traditional culture didn't notice, or when it did notice, didn't like what it saw. Not that the traditional culture wasn't doing extremely well out of the revolution, the English educational institutions took their slice of the English 19th century wealth, and perversely, it helped crystallize them in the forms we know. Almost none of the talent, almost none of the imaginative energy, went back into the revolution which was producing the wealth. The traditional culture became more abstracted from it as it became more wealthy, trained its young men for administration, for the Indian Empire, for the purpose of perpetuating the culture itself, but never in any circumstances to equip them to understand the revolution or take part in it. Far-sighted men were beginning to see, before the middle of the 19th century, that in order to go on producing wealth, the country needed to train some of its bright minds in science, particularly in applied science. No one listened. The traditional culture didn't listen at all, and the pure scientists, such as there were, didn't listen very eagerly. You will find the story, which in spirit continues down to the present day, in Eric Ashby's technology and the academics. The academics had nothing to do with the Industrial Revolution, as Corey, the old master of Jesus, said about trains running into Cambridge on Sunday, it is equally displeasing to God and to myself. So fat as there was any thinking in 19th century industry, it was left to cranks and clever workmen. American social historians have told me that much the same was true of the U.S. The Industrial Revolution, which began developing in New England 50 years or so later than ours, apparently received very little educated talent, either then or later in the 19th century. It had to make do with the guidance handy men could give it, sometimes, of course, handymen like Henry Ford, with a dash of genius. The curious thing was that in Germany, in the 1830s and 1840s, long before serious industrialization had started there, it was possible to get a good university education in applied science, better than anything England or the US could offer for a couple of generations. I don't begin to understand this, it doesn't make social sense, but it was so. With the result that Ludwig Mond, the son of a court purveyor, went to Heidelberg and learnt some sound applied chemistry. Siemens, a Prussian signals officer, at military academy and university went through what for their time were excellent courses in electrical engineering. Then they came to England, met no competition at all, brought in other educated Germans, and made fortunes exactly as though they were dealing with a rich, illiterate colonial territory. Similar fortunes were made by German technologists in the United States. Almost everywhere, though, intellectual persons didn't comprehend what was happening. Certainly the writers didn't. Plenty of them shuddered away, as though the right course for a man of feeling was to contract out, some, like Ruskin and William Morris and Thoreau and Emerson and Lawrence, tried various kinds of fancies which were not in effect more than screams of horror. It is hard to think of a writer of high class who really stretched his imaginative sympathy, who could see at once the hideous backstreets, the smoking chimneys, the internal price, and also the prospects of life that were opening out for the poor, the intimations, up to now unknown except to the lucky which were just coming within reach of the remaining 99.0% of his brother men. 
some of the 19th century Russian novelists might have done, their natures were broad enough, but they were living in a pre-industrial society and didn't have the opportunity. The only writer of world class who seems to have had an understanding of the Industrial Revolution was Ibsen in his old age, and there wasn't much that old man didn't understand.